Okay, hi. So, my name is Lorel. Everybody calls me Lo. Um, so, my project was over John Quincy Adams, the man, the legend, the highly unlike personality. So, let's get started. I only have 10 slides because that's the max I could do, but there's a lot that about this man. So, early life, he was born July 11th, 1767 in Braintree, Massachusetts Bay, now known as Quincy, Massachusetts. His parents were John Adams, our second United States president, and his mother was Abigail Smith. Um, he spent much of his youth in Europe. Um, fun fact, at the age of 14, he actually started his first diplomatic mission as being a translator for the minister to, for the envoy to Russia, um, because the Russian court spoke French and he was proficient in French. Hot take. So his political overview, very extensive. This isn't everything that he did because like I said, he did start at the young age of 14 and was in political office until the day he died. So just a quick overview. In 1794, he was appointed the minister to the Netherlands. Um, so he was there from November 1794 to June 1797. And then in December of 1797, he was appointed the first minister to Prussia um, until May 1801. He was recalled after May 1801 because his father actually lost the election of 1802. And out of fear of his son being ridiculed and humiliated by the incoming administration, which was Thomas Jefferson, hot take, his father went ahead and basically fired him. And so from the end of his term in 1801, all the way until 1803, he actually returned to Boston to open up his own law practice, which was semi-successful, kind of not. He was a horrible lawyer, but that's not what we're here for. So, in May, in March 1803 to June 1808, he was actually the United States Senator for Massachusetts. Before this, he was actually in the state legislature, but they hated him so much that they made him run for Congress because they wanted to get rid of him. Another hot take. So after that, he was not elected for another term because he basically made enemies in the Federalist Party because he kind of wasn't a real Federalist. So that's that tea. Um, so in November 1809, he was appointed the minister to Russia um, with Tsar. Tsar? It's Tsar. The vote. Alexander, okay, the <laughs> Tsar of Russia at the time, who actually was a really good friend of him, and, and they would always take walks together. Hot take. Him and Alexander had like this weird like romance thing going on. Low-key could have been a romance, but he also did have a wife at the time. Her name was Louisa. Their child died in Russia. Little girl. Kind of bad. So then he was there until April 1814. And then in June 1815, because of the mounting wars that were being all done in Europe, because Europe was like a mess at the time, like it is now, he was appointed the minister to the United Kingdom until May 1817. Um, he returned from the United Kingdom and went back into the United States, where James Monroe, the fifth president of the United States actually asked him to be his secretary of state, which is perfect for him because literally he was proficient in like French, Latin, Greek, and like he knew like all this other stuff. Like he's kind of cool, kind of amazing person. After that, after a very scandalous period, which we will talk about, he was elected president of the United States. Then, you know, he left in March of 1829, had a little break for about a year and then actually ended up back into politics as a House of Representatives member until he died later on in 1848. But that's more tea that we'll talk about later. So as Secretary of State, he served, like I said, under James Monroe. Um, he was really responsible for the struggle, struggles with Britain about the conflicts that they were having in the United States and in Europe. Um, and a lot of times he just tried to make neutral about it. Um, he did have to struggle with the Latin American power vacuum because Spain was in mounting debt and because of all the wars it had waged against everybody else and it was losing its hold over the Latin American countries. He had strategic negotiations, 
strategic, strategic in the negotiations of the U.S.-Canadian border, which would prove to be one of like the crown jewels of his time. He was also responsible for the adams onis Treaty, which basically gave us Florida. He made a blunder, actually, in there. Hot take. He actually, in there, there was two territories that he forgot to include that were actually a part of Florida. Um, basically, he forgot it, which was like the only mistake he made in his entire political career. And to this day, in his diaries, he beats himself up over it. Well, not to this day, because he's dead. But, like, he beats himself up over it all the time. And the man wrote the Monroe Doctrine. So I'm just saying, if your president was James Monroe, and you put in that one of his accomplishments was, you know, foreign policy, it wasn't. Okay. Scandal. Scandal? Yes, there was a scandal. So the election of 1824. Okay. Like it says, complex doesn't say enough. This is wild. Okay, so there was like an array of candidates, kind of like there is for like the 2020 like race or whatever, but like even more like people. It was real scandalous, real crazy. So after the populist vote, Jackson took the populist vote, but thanks to a little thing called the Electoral College, we all know about that, he gave us great presidents. After a little thing called the Electoral College, Jackson only had 99 of the votes, Adam had 84, Crawford had 41, and Clay had 37. Henry Clay, we all know about Henry Clay. Literally crazy, he's in every election. Real, real nice dude. So, here's the crazy thing. Nobody had the majority, so it had to be taken to the House of Representatives. Well, basically, there was some backroom shady dealings between Adams and Clay, which is now known as the great, the bargain of corruption, which is kind of crazy because it wasn't really that bad. Um, so, yeah. But basically, Clay gave his support to Adams and he ended up being able to swing some of those Southern votes for him. Excuse me, not Southern, Western votes for him. He also spoke to many of those, of the leaders of the Federalist Party, which was actually in disarray at this point, by telling them that if they supported him, he would not pass them over for appointments into his cabinet and basically would not forget about them in the vein, like the entire existence of political life. He kind of did, but that's, that's another story. So, later on, once he actually like secured the vote and became president of the United States, woo, yeah, he appointed Henry Clay as his secretary of state, which was literally horrible because it caused so many problems for him and basically was like, the fuel that Andrew Jackson needed to be like, I'm gonna run against this dude in 1828. We shouldn't have did that. He should have just been like, hey, Clay, like, sorry, bud. But he didn't. So, I mean, hey, things happen for a reason. As president, my man was, he did a great job, okay? He started on a very unprecedented note. He basically came into a lot of trouble for Monroe. The White House was a mess. Staff was a mess, Europe was crazy, Spain was still going crazy, everybody was crazy, okay? He signed a treaty into existence that he shouldn't have signed, but he didn't know. Wasn't his fault, so I'm just gonna leave him alone, okay? He chose a geographically diverse cabinet so that no part of the country felt unrecognized, and basically he wanted as much support behind him as he could get, which was also part of his downfall because they kind of plotted against him. Yeah, fake friends, they stab you in the back. He wanted to make major investments in internal improvements, but because he decided to have Henry Clay part of his cabinet and because he just wasn't really liked at all, all of those things fell apart. It was kind of crazy, but he did some good things. He had some good ideas. So he had the completion of several projects, which is basically the National Road. Um, railways and different things like that. So those infrastructure things were like down pat because they benefited the entire country. Um, he also advocated for the creation of a cabinet position, Secretary of the Interior. Yeah, he didn't have it. They didn't let him create it because they said they didn't need it at the time. But hot take, like before he died, there was a Secretary of the Interior. It wasn't like a cabinet position, but they did make a Secretary of the Interior. Um, and a year after he died, 
they actually made the cabinet position. That's spiteful, just saying. <clears throat> he wanted to use Western land sales as revenue rather than raising taxes or public debt. That didn't really go through because people didn't see it as one of those things that you could sell to the American people. They just saw it as a thing you could move on to. It was a good idea not to raise taxes and debt. Um, they didn't listen to him. They kind of did their own thing, backfired, and then they listened to him after he was out of office. Again, really rude and shady. And he faced hot, heavy opposition. He really did. He, there was mounting opposition against him. He could not get a lot of things through Congress, but the things that he did ended up being great successes and things that his successors would actually reap the benefits of. Uh, so like I said, he wanted internal improvements such as roads, canals, rail roads, and improvements in river navigations. And he wanted a lot to survey the land um, west of them so that they could you know, basically get it ready for inhabitation. Hot tea, he was the first and only president to keep an alligator as a pet. And because his wife was a little jealous, she wanted pets. She kept silkworms. It's kind of gross, but she kept silkworms. It's pretty cool. Um, his alignment with Clay created a lot of animosity towards his administration, even from his own parents, who, yeah, there's something else. Um, and he saw the establishment of the National Republicans and Democrats, basically Adams and Jackson. They basically split because they were really upset and all the other parties were basically failing at this point. So like they created these two things, bang. And he sought for the expansion of American trade yet again, not something that passed through Congress, but was something that later got enacted after he was in office and was a great success. His return to the private sector. So he lost, he lost to Jackson in 1828 because of the mounting opposition against him and because you know his own cabinet kind of like took him down. His son, George Washington Adams, was an interesting character. Um, he actually struggled with depression, much like his father, John Quincy Adams. So George Washington Adams struggled with depression. Um, and actually took his own life after his father, you know, lost the election because he felt a failure to the Adams name, which, you know, John, George Washington Adams and John Adams II both felt a lot of shame towards the Adams name, and they also drunk themselves basically to death. Um, he thought of permanently retiring from public life. It was actually a really big thing for him, and he he wanted to do it, but his growing resentment towards Jackson and his administration and the policies that he was enacting served as the fire for him not to retire. See what I did there? Hey, Ron, I'm a rapper. Yeah, I'll just do that. A Phoenix from the ashes. In 1830, he won a house, he won a seat in the House of Representatives, which was kind of pretty crazy because nobody really liked him, so it was kind of shocking. He actually just won his town, Quincy. Um, you win your town when it's named after you. So I'm gonna name a town after me, or a state, we don't know. <laughs> he served from 1831 to 1848, at which time he actually passed away in the house. Well, not in the house, but he, we'll talk about that. He was a part of the anti-Masonic Masonic party, um, mainly because he made so many enemies in the Federalist Party, uh, which was back home in his state of Massachusetts, which was still alive and well, despite, you know, failing everywhere else. Um, and no other party would really take him because they didn't really like him. Um, he was a chairman of the Committee on Commerce and Manufactures. So the current House Speaker actually thought that it would keep him busy and keep him out of the way. <laughs> but, but no. So he was integral in the nullification crisis um, my man's actually like slid in and like diffused that whole thing. So I mean, well, I mean, he didn't diffuse it by himself, but he was an integral part in talking to the governor and talking him down and basically getting everybody to be like, hey, like federal government isn't that bad. So I mean, if any other president tries to take, you know, credit for the nullification crisis, my man's did it and he wasn't even president anymore. So I'm just saying. Um, and he had an anti-slavery stance that was influenced, that influenced many of his de decisions about expansion. So he was really big on 
protection of the rights of Native people, and he was also a avid opponent of slavery and everything that came with it. Um, what else did I want to talk about? So, um, so as we all know, one of the most troublesome times things during his time was actually the border between the United States and Canada, the 43rd parallel. So he actually used his contacts in these foreign countries and the fact that he knew a lot about their cultures to actually be, you know, an advocating voice for this. He was very, he was an integral part of Yet That Again. Um, in his own diaries and in biographies written by him, it is said that had Adams not been involved in that, then we may not have the border that we know to this day. So yet again, if your president's trying to take part of that and be like, hey, though, no, that was mine. It wasn't. My man's John Quincy Adams did that. Okay? So the bitter end. He fought to the end. Literally. So... February 21st, 1848, he was having troubles with his words. He actually had just suffered a minor stroke a few weeks prior and came back to the house, where they were actually talking about the Mexican-American War veterans and about whether or not to honor them and basically give them the same pensions since he was very outspoken against it. Everyone expected him to vote no. But by his diaries, readings, and by his family, he actually intended to say yes because he believed that any person that fought for America, no matter if it was bad or good, should always be honored for their contributions toward American expansion and American independence. So as he stood up to say yes, he actually fumbled and said no because of his confusion. Later on down the line, when he stood to answer a question from the chair, he could not speak. He ended up falling to the ground and he had a minor brain hemorrhaging. So two days later on February 23rd, he passed away at his home in Quincy, Massachusetts, surrounded by his loving family and like the one kid he had left. So yes, this is John Quincy Adams, who's in a, he, in my opinion, after reading about him, very well unliked. but. His upbringing did serve a lot to who he was. He was verbally abused and physically abused by both his mother and father. His first wife was atrocious um, and his children were not good children. So, my man was just misunderstood and did a great job, honestly. 